It's your favorite time of week once again on the Edge of Innovation with the Disruptive AF Podcast. Welcome back as we not only bring ourselves, Trigger Jordan, and my favorite, Daniel Holter. Hello, Dan. Hey, what's up, Trigger? <laughs> hey, hey, man, we got a great show for you guys today as we're bringing you not only the man, the myth, the legend himself, but John Margalik is the director of the Centers of Adaptive Warfighting for Naval X. Now, that's that's a statement inside of itself. That's probably the coolest title ever next to Supreme Overlord Galactic Leader, which I think there's some commander over in Europe that has that. But anyway, anyway, so John, he's pursued different ways to be able to adapt to the Department of Defense in an ever-changing world. His experience inside itself in ways of design thinking, agile scrum, lean startup, and the ways which teach us how to shape our mission, vision, and what we're doing in our lives. And not only that, Dan, but he's actually an advocate, much like yourself, for empowering leaders and warfighters, for delivering industries, best practices, all across complex problem-solving situations and ideation. I mean, the, the, you two are peas in the pod right here. I love it. John, Man, welcome. I, I can't even tell you how excited I am to have John from the car over here. Just <laughs> there. The, what I've, I've been like kind of taunting the Air Force about how the Navy's been doing it better <laughs> for like, I don't, I don't know, about six months. I'm like, hey, why aren't we doing that thing over there? That's, that's real innovation. And he's here with us, John. Welcome. Gosh, you were the, the way you made it sound. I was like, I'm really excited to meet this guy. He sounds important. It took me a second for it to click that you might conceivably be talking about me. <laughs> well, I guess we're doing our jobs well. That's well. So, uh, man, uh, John, when we when I first met Dan and he was talking about design thinking and thinking, you know, being able to actually address problem solving from the way it should be at first and dan you don't know this i thought you were a little bit nuts because i've been in the innovation realm for a long time but i've never heard it put in the design thinking mentality and you know when you're talking about agile scrum and how do we how do you approach these issues and john dan this is as i've heard daniel talk about this several times and we bring more and more guests on that are talking about it it's freaking exciting i mean it's absolutely exciting the mindset of approaching problems with this kind of ground up mentality and really boiling it down to the basics. So uh, first about yourself, but what got you into this? Like, have you always been this guy who thinks like that? Or did you get into it while you're a Naval X? How did this happen? That's such an interesting set of questions. I just want to say in passing uh, that it's uh, not only a pleasure, but an honor to be here with both of you, having followed your individual and collective work for some time. Uh, however impressive the introduction might have been, however much that was you doing your job vis-a-vis -vis yours truly. Um, First of all, uh, thank you for having me. And second of all, uh, thank you for doing all the work that's made it so interesting to be a part of this conversation. Um, and third of all, isn't it nice that we're all, this is re relevant, I promise, um, part of this larger ecosystem of people across all the services and really truly like outside of the services who are learning how to slot these tools into place together and mutually support one another sort of unconditionally. Right, which um, is is not, I think, irrelevant to how every one of us gets started. Um, the first answer yeah. is you run into somebody who knows how, right? Yeah, um, that's so important. Just that you immediately jump into the jointness of the car because that's that's one of the the defining characteristics of it that really it stood out to me as you guys were looking at increasing the innovativeness of service members themselves. But I don't want to get ahead of, of you telling your telling your journey about, you know, getting into this stuff. Yeah, no, I appreciate uh, the distinction, right? And actually, maybe I should just ask before I dive in too far, do we want to talk about the cause specifically um, or like how I got into innovation more generally, which, which is going to be of more interest here? Well, let's start off with you because normally when we... Uh where you started and where the foundations that kind of molded you in this in this thought process always lead to what it is doing now and it's really important for our listeners to really understand listen you are no different than a lot of our listeners are where you started initially that got you uh, got you thinking about it because it's easy to look at quote unquote celebrities of the innovation realm um and say oh my gosh like they're so different well in reality they're not so show us your human john how did you get <laughs> show us your, a human it's being so bleeds just like us uh, how did you get into this like what what led you into this realm of thinking gosh i feel like we're at the part where i should definitely have a beer on hand and not just a fizzy water <laughs> yeah. um so 
I, you know, I, I think for anybody who ends up in this realm, there are probably a bunch of different answers to that, right? And some of them are personality based and some of them are environmental uh, and some of them have a lot to do with happenstance. So um, I am by inclination and always have been something of a chaos muppet. Um, if you haven't run into this distinction before, there's this great, it's like 2011, 2012 um, Slate article by Dahlia Lithwick. Um, she says, people don't know this, but there are basically two types of, of uh, people in the world, the same way there are two types of Muppets. You got your chaos Muppets, the like uh, Gonzos and Fozzies and Oscar the Grouches and Ernie's, uh, and they just want a new thing every day. They want to have the new idea. They want to move on to the next thing. And then you got your order Muppets. That's like Bert, Sam the Eagle, right? These are the people who, like, they got a bottle cap collection. It is indexed. They know where everything is. They want tomorrow to be just like today. Um, I ran into her a few years ago, actually, uh, at a law school reunion. And she had, um, we, we have a picture now of both of us holding up signs saying, hi there, I'm a chaos Muppet. Um, <laughs> That's incredible. And the thing, the thing I love about innovation and the thing it took me a little while to realize is that it takes both types of Muppets. Um, but it's most comfortable for chaos Muppets, which because that's, or at least the, the entry into it is, yeah. it seems kind of anathema to your order Muppet. So I realized a long time ago that I'm a chaos Muppet type and I wanted to be trying new things and I love new ideas and I love meeting people and recombining and finding the new thing and testing it out. Um, but that's where novelty and creativity lie, right? And it, oh, until yeah. you figure out how to get the order Muppets on board. Uh, You're gonna have a really hard time about finishing any of these thoughts because I just always want to jump in. I, I like this, uh, this idea of the chaos Muppet. I can't believe I've never heard you say that before. I wrote a thing like six months ago or something. <laughs> it was uh, called Agitate on being the unfrozen middle. And it was entirely this, it was, you know, people are talking about the frozen middle and I was like, well, what is, what is freezing? It's things just kind of locking into their lowest energy state, right? It's molecules that crystallize into a, a low energy, like, uh, you know, structure. And what can I do to prevent from being a part of the frozen middle or to unfreeze the people around me? I can agitate. I, if I act like a molecule that's just moving around a lot and stirring the pot. And that's exactly what I'm hearing from you is that there are these people and, and I've kind of taken it as my role as well. I take information and I'm like, let me just throw that information over here in this pile and see what happens when it mixes together. Um, and I think that really gets to the heart of what the cause is doing uh, with, because that's exactly what design thinking does is it takes is it takes a bunch of brains and it's like, let's take all those out of your heads and let's mash them up into a pile and put them on the wall and see what happens. So, it's so true. Before you dive into that, just real quick, for the people who don't know what design what design thinking is, we talk a lot about it, but I'm, I know there's a lot of people like me where we've done innovation stuff, but we've not been seen that aspect of of from the ground up and just throwing these ideas on the board like you're talking about. What does that look like? Well, like, what what is that? If you can summarize that in two sentences, what is that? What is that experience? So everybody's going to do this for you a little differently. Design thinking is, a, is the antidote to all the things you hate most about meetings. It's nothing more complicated or less fundamental than just being able to converse with other people in a way that makes it possible to actually communicate. Um, and there are nuances to that, obviously, and there are like PhD levels of being able to get into this. But really, it's things like permitting everybody to talk simultaneously without detracting from anybody's ability to contribute. It's um, everybody in the room gets an equal vote, regardless of their rank or how old they are or whether they sit at the front of the conference table. Usually um, it's a process by which the best ideas, the best understandings are gathered early in and everybody leaves the room with a good idea of the road ahead and a sense that they were heard and were able to contribute and that the answers you came up with at the end ultimately belong to them as much as to anybody else. Yeah. Is that fair, Daniel? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it's so difficult to put into a box, right? Especially when you, when you remove the, the sort of dogmatic frameworks of it, which is what I think that the CAW does really well. And what we're trying to do with Agitari as well is this 
sort of dogma agnostic version of what are we talking about when we talk about human centered design? It's just, it's taking people and allowing them to be their maximum amount of creative, their maximum amount of expressive, and the, and in that way, uh, and then a allowing them to bounce off of each other in this in this way that they can create unique combinations of ideas that they wouldn't have been able to without some form of uh, framework. It's like yeah, we, when you said like the theoretical stuff gets it can get into like the doctorate level, but it's like. I, uh, my favorite way to sum it up is applying just the proper amount of constraint to an environment that everybody participates and you maximize the sort of synergy of a bunch of people in a sing going, you know, working towards a, a singular goal. It's so, so true. And actually to return to the earlier thread, this is part of why it's important to have both order Muppets and chaos Muppets, right? If you just put a bunch of people in a room and everybody is is invited to have whatever crazy ideas they want without structure, it's going to be white noise. It's going to be chaos. Everybody's going to hate it. You need somebody in there who can say, hey, why don't we modify our social conversational compact a little bit so that we actually get something out of this? Um, the Defense Innovation Board uh, and, and through them, Steve Blank and a bunch of the other folks who have been sort of directing, directing, guiding, contributing to this conversation at the OSD level, but also out in the world, are, are fond of saying that um, creativity, innovation, making something new that solves a problem has doctrine, just as well as like, how to operate a battalion or how to perform uh, you know, squad level tactics has doctrine. Um, and in neither case is it a thing that you have to follow. It's always going to be just so. But if you know the basic steps, if you understand why they work and when they work and when they don't, then you can take control of, you know, in a traditional military doctrine sense, like um, a tactical or, or unit level or procedural or bureaucratic environments. And in a design thinking sense, you can take control of complex, previously unknown, poorly understood problems, right? They're just different doctrine for different situations. And you gotta, you gotta understand it and work with it um, in a very traditional, like be the water kind of Bruce Lee way. Um, but it makes it possible for everybody to operate on an implicit basis in a way that we're really quite accustomed to looking for in other contexts, even when you're encountering something new with strangers. Yeah, absolutely. I um, I I think it's really interesting to think of it in terms of like you were talking a little bit about serendipity. Um, the the reality. I, I like to think of it as at any given moment with any given problem, we don't actually understand what's right outside of our immediate view, right? And the only way to discover our way, like what is actually around us, the opportunities or the or the best possible avenues to to solve a problem or something is to explore and to and that exploration is a way it is a way of kind of seeking out serendipity to 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 like because it's it's going to be it requires a bit of randomness and so uh, that facilitation is is like you said is a combination of you know making chaos and structure kind of hold hands and, and work together towards a common goal, which is, a, it's, it's a big task, but there are now, like what, when people, most people think of design thinking, they think of these very structured exercises because people have come up with these really interesting ways that using, you know, using sticky notes and for example, the mountain exercise, you can get a, you can take a group of people through this journey to just explore the adjacent possible around them and find great avenues for uh for innovation that were so, so an example do. what's the, what's the mountain exercise for those who don't know so the mountain exercise is um sort of the classic example of divergent thinking where you're not trying to be practical and you're not trying to ask you're not trying to, to figure out exactly what direction to head from here you're just trying to let a room full of people contribute collectively simultaneously to your understanding of how the world is, how the world could be, and what the difference is between those two spaces, right? So you use sticky notes, everybody puts one idea on each sticky note and shares out loud what they're putting up there. And you do each of those three things in order. First, you do the bottom of the mountain, the status quo, 
and everybody has a period of time to throw up as many descriptors as they can of the pain points they experience about a particular problem. And you want to focus on pain points because if it doesn't cause anybody pain, why are you spending any time thinking about how to fix it? Right? Um, one of the central insights at the heart of design thinking is that it is centered around users, around humans, around war fighters, the way that we've structured it and their experience of what's happening. What I think of as the ground truth. And you spend your time there first just sketching, limbing out uh, what is wrong right now. And then you put a mountain, the mountain top on the wall and you say, okay, above that mountain top, let's sketch out utopia, right? We have the status quo, let's do utopia. All the things that the world would look like for this problem if everything were as good as it could possibly be. No constraints, master the universe, as much money as you want, president and sec def both show up and say, hey, we'll do whatever you tell us to do. Like be unreasonable about this. We're all members of the United States military. We're deeply unreasonable human beings to begin with. Uh, so that turns out to be fairly easy to do if you just get people in the right frame of mind. And then once they've done that, you do the middle of the mountain, which is the, the climb, the ladder. Okay, how do we get from, what action do we take to move from status quo up to utopia. Give me as many examples as you possibly can. And then from there, you can do a bunch of exercises, having gathered all of that information without judgment or hesitation and pragmatism, you can do a bunch of more pragmatic and judgment-based exercises to start discerning what the patterns are in there, winnowing out what you could, might do, thinking about how to prioritize those things according to impact and the level of lift to actually accomplish it. But that's what starts you off just kind of sketching out your world as it's seen and experienced by all the people in the room. Well, that's a completely different, that's a completely different way of approaching it. Yeah. So of approaching it, it, it any really problem. Exciting. I mean, if you, if you look at how a normal meeting would go of, Oh, we have a problem. Well, what does everybody think? Okay, yeah, we think this is a possibility. That's a possibility. All right, get back to me next week, and we're gonna have. Uh, give me your top three codes. Um, <laughs> just by <laughs> even posing the question, just by even posing the question in that manner, you have shot down so many possibilities by just approaching it that way. And that's what I don't think people realize the what the importance of design thinking is that it's not. Um, cause you know, you, you hear the rhetoric that people have, Oh, you know, that's that fluffy approach to getting everybody involved. No, no, no. It's, it's not a fluffy approach to getting everybody involved. It's not immediately cutting off potential solutions with your nearsightedness of trying to solve a problem immediately. It's not, it's not fluffy. And it's the same type of thing. I mean, it's the same mindset where people look at innovation. Oh, you know, innovation is just, you know, it, it's just this mindset of if you're trying to, to look at different ways of doing things. Yeah, but we're trying to look at all possibilities. And may the best idea win. And that's really what it has to come down to. May the best idea win when uh, you enable people to be able to bring their approach and bring their mindset and bring their thoughts to uh, a collective whole and allow everybody to see it. You're touching trigger on a, a soapbox. I do my best to stand on every opportunity I get. Stand on it. Um, and this is me standing on that soapbox and crowing to the world. People say innovation and mean very different things. And I want to I wanna argue to the community that we need to forcefully reject one way of thinking about innovation and forcefully soapbox and advocate for a different way of thinking about innovation. And the thing we need to reject is the thing that has given innovation a bad name by people mm. who are using it, often with good intentions, but with bad execution. It mm -hmm. is not novelty. It is not creativity. It requires those things. Sticky notes, tape, walls, all that stuff, innovation more generally has gotten a bad name in part because people who are rightly focused on results often see people heading into a room saying they're going to innovate and nothing ever changes. People spent time doing stuff I couldn't see or appreciate. They came back. It was a waste of everybody's time. I'm glad we're not going to be doing that again in my unit. And I know that because I'm going to enforce it, right? Innovation, and, and actually the chief definition I hear used of innovation by the most serious innovation scholars in the Marine Corps, the Navy, and I think the other services is the, the um, adoption of a new practice by a community. There's nothing in there about solving problems. 
I don't believe that it is worthwhile to talk about innovation if we're not talking about making something better. And there's a normative judgment in there, but not everything a community starts doing is good and not everything it stops doing is a thing it shouldn't have stopped doing. Innovation is problem focused. And if you're not solving problems, you are wasting people's time. Recognizing that we can often spend time being creative or novel or experimenting and playing, and we have to in order to someday solve problems. We that's a muscle that we have to practice with. Yeah, yeah. Right. There's a whole process. It's not that you solve a problem every day, but if you aren't asking yourself constantly, if you don't have that order muppet in the room saying, "Hey, how might we get from here to something that makes somebody's life better, or kills more of the people we're supposed to be killing, or protects more of the people we're supposed to be protecting?" Yeah. Then what are you doing? Yeah. The, I, yeah, I think, I think the, the epitome of that mindset or that statement is I've heard people say, well, it sounds like we're supposed to do this innovation stuff. So why don't you stand up a cell? Yeah. What? Oh, I've seen that so many times. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. And I don't even know what to like, say to you right now. <laughs> yeah. We, we talked a little bit uh, with our last guest about the idea that it, the, the greatest risk is not in embracing the risk of innovation, but in not embracing that. Uh, and I think I've seen you kind of speak to the same thing on LinkedIn, John, this idea that we're not safe sitting still. Like it's, it's like, uh, it's like anything where you can expect the environment around you to change. And if you're not paying attention to that and the emerging risks of dilapidated systems of poor communication procedures of, you know, of all of this stuff of our, of our stuff, just over the course of time, losing its effectiveness or us losing sight of the value it was intended to create is a much greater risk than a little bit of that. The process inefficiency, of course, is there's an immediate process inefficiency in innovation. Um, it's, you know, there, there is no guaranteed output to running a workshop except for maybe that people got to express themselves and that has it to me that has some pretty profound cultural impacts. Um, but I, I think that the, the risk that you didn't have something come out on the end of, other end of a single workshop is significantly lower than the risk of not engaging in continuous discovery. That's right. Yeah. And recognizing that, uh, that's the right way to put this. I asked, um, I was talking with a vendor a few weeks ago. We were trying to find somebody who could teach agile transformation to large units. And um, one of my, my standard questions when I'm trying to figure out who's going to be good at that and who is, is uh, just making it up is, how would you explain agility to somebody who didn't understand it? Um, and he said, this is, agility is like healthy. Like every time you hear that in your head, just think, Somebody's trying to understand how to become healthy. We were talking about Scrum in particular, and he said, Scrum is just Scrum is just a way, it's like running. It's a way that some people choose of starting to get healthy. And if you run a whole lot, you're going to get healthier. You're also going to realize, hey, maybe, maybe these two packs of cigarettes I'm smoking every day are bad for me. Maybe I'll cut those out. Maybe I should eat more vegetables. Maybe I should lift some weights too. Maybe I should do this other stuff. Um, but if you start running, you're on the road to health. You're on your way. And design any method of getting after create like functional drive us forward creativity is a way of doing that. So workshops are lifting finger weights, right? Uh, doing design blitzes, hanging out with other people, finding ideas that have worked in other contexts and seeing how you might use them in yours. I mean, I, at some level, everything that we do, I, I love that design thinking is, is sort of the manifestation of John Boyd's creation and destruction essay. You know, he's talking about recombining elements of four different vehicles and coming up with the, um, the snowmobile and how all the ideas are already out there. And you just need to step back and look at things first through a keyhole and then decomposing everything and recombining it until it's something new. All of that are just ways of getting healthy, right? And there's no thing you can point at and say, uh, that's going to make you healthy. But by the same token, if you don't do any of the stuff, if you weren't practicing innovation, doing workshops, finding the right doctrine, identifying the people, giving them time, trust, and top cover, you're never going to get healthy. Yeah. I think it's interesting like to use the analogy of, of health because it's organic. And I think that maybe uh, where a lot of people go wrong is in thinking, I, I like to fight really hard against this concept of systems of systems because it gives us 
a little too much confidence that we can control things. Uh, oh yeah, you know, we're like, yeah, yeah. Because if you can build a machine, right, and then it'll mm -hmm. just run forever if you keep oiling it. But human systems aren't machines; they're organic. Yeah, that's right. Right. That's so right. I, I like that health uh, analogy uh, really a lot because it, it just immediately takes you to that place of there's decay and there's removing old cells and there's, you know, there's tearing muscle so that it grows bigger. There are there are these these elements of organic uh, biology that I think you don't get from analogies where you just treat things like systems. That's right. Yeah, it's it's it goes in all the different directions. Hey, that's a great point. We're going to take a break here in just a second. When we come back, we're going to be diving into how you and your organization can grab hold of this design thinking mentality. If you don't know anything about it, that's okay. We're going to get you wrapped up in it here in just a second as we take a break right here on Disruptive AF. Make sure you subscribe by hitting the subscribe button right over there if you're watching on YouTube and the bell so you don't miss the content or Make sure you follow us along on anywhere that a podcast is available, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you're at, right here on Disruptive AF, your edge of innovation. Defense innovation is made possible by the power of community and collaboration, which is why AFWorks created a chat workspace, the Innovators Chat, where you can connect with other like-minded innovators. Join more than 400 defense entrepreneurs already on the platform to discuss topics like software development, policy innovation, funding resources, books and media, and more. Find more at afworks.af.mil. Hey, welcome back to Disruptive AF, the AFWorks podcast. I'm here with my good friend Trigger Jordan, and we are talking to one of my favorite people in the defense innovation community, Mr. John Margulik, who is the director of the Centers for Adaptive Warfighting at Naval X. And I, I barely even let him get through any of his introduction because every other word he says, I get too excited and I have to interrupt him and, and talk about that. I'm like, let's just talk about that one word you said. And my favorite from before the break was Chaos Muppet. Love that concept. Um, and I, I highly identify with the concept. But let's dig a little bit into the mechanism of what you've been doing with Centers for Adaptive Warfighting and how they're using, you know, we talked a little bit about design thinking what what is the value proposition generally for centers for adaptive warfighting and how are they making that happen for uh, enabling innovation from the ground up golly let's start with the small questions right before i say anything else i want to um i want to say a thing about the word director which is really really weird in this context we chose it early on i think in some level it is a misnomer it's certainly misleading for a couple of reasons. One of them is that Brandon Smart um, has been my partner in thought and crime and thought crime um, since the beginning of this thing. And uh, anything I am in any measure responsible for, he is probably more responsible for. So um, as we talk about the call, I, I just want to be really clear that um, I, I, it, there would be nothing without him. <laughs> Uh, even if I were, had been without him, all that I I had I, I was able to be, um, but also that um, you know I don't, I don't direct anything, right? I am an instigator, I'm I'm a conduit for resources, um, and I am a, a man who has been fabulously lucky in the people he's been able to find and and be surrounded by, and the things that we built, um, we've worked really hard to make this the case have been built by our instructors, our teams, the almost exclusively volunteers who we've identified across the force um, and who stretch from uh, San Diego to Jacksonville to Virginia Beach and um, who are by and large like much smarter and harder working and more on the ground about this stuff than um, I've had the privilege to be. And um, it, what credit there is goes to them, right? So, you know, you asked, what is a call? <laughs> yeah. And, and what is the value proposition there? Um, a Center for Adaptive Warfighting is a group of people who teach our 
uh, I wouldn't say proprietary, but let's say uh, carefully hones versions of three different disciplines um, to anybody who wants to have it from within the military community and who are themselves practitioners of each of them so that they can speak not only to the sort of intellectual underpinnings, the philosophical meat and potatoes, but also to what it looks like to do something with it. Everything we produce is field stripped down to its bare essence. Um, we're not here to give you the 201, 301, 401, 501 college class version. This is the 101. This is the like, we usually say at the beginning of our classes, like we'll play the, the um, clip from the movie Hitch where Will Smith is uh, trying to teach Kevin James to be a little more successful on the dating scene. Kevin James, head of the club, they've, they've reached that point in the, the mentor 2T relationship um, where it's time for Kevin James to go to the club. Kevin James is like, yeah, this is the one thing I'm not worried about. And Will Smith is like, well, okay, yeah, but I want to see what we're talking about here. I'm going to put on some music, do the dance. And Kevin James, 30 seconds later, is like starting a fire and he's doing the Q-tip. And Will Smith is like, shut the music down. Stop. Don't ever do that again. I don't want everyone is, this is where you live. This is your home now. And the point he's making, right, is you can get in the club and have a good time just doing that. And that's what our classes are, right? Later on, you can do twirls, you can be throwing people around, go to the circus, find the trapeze, but just to get in the club and have a good time, you don't need all the bells and whistles. You can do the seven or eight or nine or 10 things that we teach you in any of our one or two day classes, right? And, and they're mostly two days when they're in person and when we pivoted, they're now all online. We can do it in four hours or eight hours by and large just get you in the club and get you those basic steps. It'll make it possible for you to learn why it's important to dance and show other people around you what dancing looks like. People love to dance, it turns out, right? So these courses um, do three things. The first one, the design one, Warfighter Center Design, is just teach you to ideate together. Let's have some ideas. Let's find some people who have a problem, come to understand that problem according to both their understanding as the havers of the problem and our understanding as third parties and as experts in some of the disciplines that might be brought to bear to solve the problem and come up with an idea of the way to have. And we say it's warfighter centered design because one, it's field stripped and accessible to anybody. Two, it's not just about users generally, this is about making us a more effective warfighting outfit, right? And Three, this is about listening to your warfighters. And if you're you know, a Marine who has a, a platoon, that means one set of things. If you're at a warfare center or a, uh, any part of the research development test and evaluation enterprise, um, it might mean something else about how you figure out what warfighters need and how you might contribute to getting it to them over a six month or a one year or 20 year timeline. But if you're not asking who depends on me and what do they need from me, how do I make sure that I'm getting it to them in the best possible way in the best possible time? Then you should be. And these are easy tools to do that. So just ideate is warfighter center design. Yeah. Two, we use what's called the lean startup set of tools. We teach it as mission accelerator. Cause again, we want all of this stuff to just be kind of easy to understand from our context. It should be in our vernacular and there's work you shouldn't have to do in order to get in the club and do that basic dance. So we do all the translation. Mission Accelerator course is all about testing. We assume that you've had Warfighter Center Design. We usually teach it right afterwards, but you might be the type of person or you might be in the type of the unit where you got good ideas all the time, right? Somebody said, hey, I think if we did this, life would be better in the following way. Cool, but is that true? Well, you need ways to test that hypothesis that are as cheap and as fast and as de-risked as humanly possible. And the more of each of those things they are, the more things you can be testing simultaneously. Because if you have, let's say, a million dollar testing budget or a thousand dollar testing budget, you don't want to spend a million dollars or a thousand dollars to test an idea. You want to spend 25 cents. And in that way, you can test many more ideas simultaneously than if you could only test an idea with a thousand dollars, right? Yeah. So ideate, test, and then scrum is execute. How do we, in a chaotic environment where we're all responsible for a billion things, to 2 billion people uh, and they're changing every day. How do we make sure that we follow through on that stuff in a way that is faithful to what other people need from us? Each of these is totally industry standard, right? They're all in use at Fortune 500 companies. People have made billions of dollars with these tools. 
And I would argue they are totally familiar to anybody who knows anything about mission commands and the ways that we're supposed to be structuring our actions, but we just never figured out how to apply those philosophies for execution at home. And the civilian sector never had to go in theater. They were never downrange with those tools. So they figured out how to apply it in the marketplace. And now we're just retranslating their retranslation back into our world so that we can use it in garrison. So if you combine those things, come up with ideas, test your ideas, execute your ideas, and you build a big cycle of them, what you get if you have enough of a team together is an innovation and agility engine at your team or your unit or your larger organization. And I say this, by the way, we realized that on our own, that those things lined up that way. But it turns out we weren't alone. I was talking to the, um, one of the, the heads of the National Security Innovation Network a few months ago, and he was like, hey, I heard you guys are teaching these three things. I want you to understand how they fit together. And then he talked me through exactly that cycle, right? He had never heard me talk about it before. But it, it made exactly that sense to him. And then a week or so ago, we found a Medium article citing uh, some work from Gartner, G-A-R-T-N-E-R, -E which is just think of it as like one of the big consulting firms out in the world. And they had drawn exactly the same cycle to explain how those things fit together and why you should innovate using them. So obviously, yeah. we're, we're the most brilliant and dashing and accomplished and whatever people on the block. But, but the real point... Yeah. Uh, is that this isn't the evidence of that because that's it's just um, to your point from earlier trigger like if you're working hard and using the best available tool to come up with new stuff you're going to arrive at this understanding sooner than later and we've just saved you a step or two so yeah like i when i first heard about the centers for adaptive warfighting i saw what they're doing i got so excited because i've been kind of i've had this thing in my head for a while now where the only thing that I was aware of was it was like the spark tank, right? And it, and it seemed like the things that we that we were being offered as airmen, and this is this is changing pretty rapidly with the you know with the expansion of the spark cells, and the air force is more focusing on how we can push these things to lower levels. But you know, two two years ago, uh, it was just there. It was just moonshots, basically. It was just how are we, you know. How are we getting great ideas and how are we giving them all the funding they need to go forward? But what you're talking about is setting a sustainable cadence for innovation at ground level, just as a culture, you know, as like an attribute of how we do business, which just speaks so much to me because, you know, I've been ranting for a really long time about exclusive versus inclusive innovation. Do you do innovation as a separate channel, as this thing over here? And you're like, well, they're they're delivering projects for us, so we did it. We're innovative now. Where where like airmen on the ground within the Air Force, in my experience, it was like, how are you, how are how are we having the experience of you know spending two hours trying to just access my email? And you say we're innovative now because they built a two million dollar widget over there for people on the front lines, you know. So I'm I'm like. It felt like it was really speaking to my experience as an airman, and uh, and that's why I'm so excited about the Centers for Adaptive Warfighting and and seeing you know uh, people within the Air Force now applying some of these some of these principles, uh, having gone through your classes, and I've been through the the uh, Warfighter Center design myself, and uh, and I'm familiar with the other stuff you guys do. So I, I really like that. Let's look at it from a from you know building an engine that can just keep running because when you just look at the stuff that's like exceptional or exclusive it's not a sustainable model for the rest of the organization no and it's intended to do different things right i mean i think it's yeah. incumbent upon people who operate in large institutions to recognize that you want a hammer for hammer problem and a screwdriver for screwdriver problems and woe unto him or her who can't tell the difference between either tool or either problem, right? You're never going to yeah, solve yeah. them or it's going to be like 50, 50 uh, yeah. and you're going to hurt your thumb a bunch. Um, but, but like horizon three innovation, right? Like the huge disruptive um, is actually, this is a question I had looking at your podcast, like disruptive AF. I get it, right? Like there are horizon three needs. If we want to be preparing for 25 or 50 or hundred years from now, we have to disrupt occasionally our ways of thinking about how we do business or how somebody else is going to do business. We need to be prepared for that. And um, woe again unto those who are not the first to disrupt. Uh, but also Horizon 2 innovation, taking something from one place where it works and putting it in a place where it hasn't yet 
and making it work there or horizon one innovation, just optimizing stuff where you are with what you have are both really important. And those muscles are interrelated, right? For a variety of reasons. Some, you can't expect somebody who's been doing the same thing day in and day out for 30 years, never having evolved to suddenly come up with horizon three disruptive innovation, right? That's not how that worked. And then some also because, and this is an insight that um, I got from Lieutenant General Mike Dana before he retired, um, I was in his office. Um, you can't, and it, it's what you were alluding to earlier, Dan, innovation can't be a thing that, that we had, that just some small set of people does if you want anybody else to feel at all good about it. Yeah. Everybody has to have the opportunity to get in there. It's not everybody's like bag of cake or whatever, you know, pick your metaphor, right? Bag of cake but <laughs> everybody, everybody has to have the chance in part because it's really hard to predict ahead of time who's going to be good at it. And in part because we rightly resent systems that don't give us the chance that somebody else was given. Right. And we have no problem with systems where everybody got a chance to show up and try. And some people were better at it than others. You know, maybe it's not our favorite thing uh, that somebody's better at it than we are. But if they are like, it's their thing and I'm going to go do this thing and I'm better at that's the world most of us want to live in. Well, yeah, but there's 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 also the 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 mindset that if you exclude, if you have it be exclusivity where it's just a group of people that are doing this and it's their job and you before I knew what DARPA was, eventually you learn that's, you know, DARPA is essentially an institute where people isolate themselves and they create these, you know, they do the deep dive into technology and development and everything else. But what does that mean for the rest of us who are interested in that? Like you have to find a way into it in order to be in that area of design development thinking. And does that really help the organization? I would argue, I would submit, no, it doesn't because the organization continues chugging on on its own way, doing what it's always done, expecting that this group separately of people are going to somehow solve their problem when you're right. not- it's somebody else's those... responsibility for, to make us better. Yeah, not <laughs> yeah. But, but where <laughs> yeah. you actually start seeing transformational changes in organizations and processes and the way that we do things is by creating an environment that that's the culture. It's not something you try to do every now and then. It's something that that's just who we are. And we yeah. started Alexa, that. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, Trigger. I, so uh, this is a thing I think about a lot that I got from Alexis Bunnell, who's the chief innovation officer at USAID. She's, she says, innovation is about permeability, right? Your organization is innovative if it's easy for ideas to waft in and out rather than having to fight or for it to be impossible for them to go from one place to another. Yeah. And one of the things I love, you know, I, I love it in particular about the CAW because, you know, it, this is a great example. It's brought me in touch with the two of you. Um, every, you know, we we often have people tell us after classes, like, hey, I work at a warfare center or I'm an army ranger. Uh, I never get to talk to like Marines who were forward deployed yesterday. And I got to do that in your class. Mm -hmm. Thanks for bringing us together and vice versa, right? I never knew the people who built my software before. But just even those light touch connections are an infinite percentage increase over no connection. Yeah. And by the same token, to your point, Trigger, if you bring people from DARPA into the room with all the people they don't see on a regular basis, they can be like, hey, we're building a thing that could solve that problem for you. Why do you why do you think you still have that problem? And they're like, well, I've never yeah. had the tool. Well, let me get one for you. Cool. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. incredible, like just having joined uh, a couple of networks and kind of becoming a connector myself, just where I kind of collect people and I can I can facilitate an incredible amount of innovation just by being like talk to that guy over there. Oh, you got this here. Talk to this guy over here. They're working that. And then everybody kind of wins from that increased connectivity. There's another real danger of having of the exclusive model of innovation, even though, even though you do need the horizon one, horizon two and horizon three, when you keep them too separated, mm -hmm. you end up mm -hmm. with, you end up with the development of solutions that didn't include the customer enough. And that is a problem that that a lot of the uh, every branch of the military has had for such a long time now that we're only just now figuring out how to solve is uh, when we when we create solutions, we don't go diagnose and then be like, I got this and go back to our lab and then build a whole solution. This is some of the power of, uh, you know, human centered design, design thinking and also, uh, you know, like the lean startup model as well, is that the whole process of innovation is, is in contact the entire time with the people who are you, whose problem you're supposed to be solving. Um, and if you try and do that, I think even with Horizon 3 stuff, if you try and do that at too, too great a distance, you're going to find yourself coming 
back to, you know, back into the environment with something that solves a problem that doesn't actually exist because you, you, you know, you didn't continue to make those. I like the analogy of when you're flying a, you know, flying an airplane a long distance, it's not just like, I, okay, I set a direction and then I go. There are thousands and thousands of course corrections along the way. It is constantly yeah. firing those, you know, adjustments to, to make sure that we're dealing with wind, but also because that we're just not accurate enough to, to be able to like pick a distant target and, and like pull ourselves there. So you have to constantly just be like, no, a little to the left, a little to the right. And that's what having that constant contact with the user is all about. You're yeah. so right. And I, I actually think that that insight is at the heart of what makes these tools so powerful. Um, a, a friend of mine, you may know Chris O'Keefe actually. Um, yeah. Uh, is fond of saying that that people think of human-centered design, user-centered design, as being weird. Like, why would you design around anything? Um, but like, we actually are doing a, a kind of design almost all the time. We're doing compliance-centered design. That's his phrase. Yeah. Uh, and and I actually think it's fair to go one step further and say, like, there are only two worldviews. Right? There are only two things that you can be doing, and you're doing one of them at every single moment of your life. You're either doing compliance-centered design, optimizing for compliance, or you're optimizing to solve a problem for somebody. And we need both of those things the same way we need chaos muppets and we need order muppets. But if you don't, here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. If you don't have human-centered design, if, you, if you're not doing, Daniel, what you're describing and keeping your eye on a problem that somebody has, then you have no way to get out of compliance. Yeah. You have a requirements document and that's what you're gonna go with. You have a set of legal constraints and you're never gonna go outside of them. And you're actually not even gonna get it close because it's only sensible when compliance is the only thing that you wanna optimize for when CYA and not screwing up and getting fired and ending your career or losing your warrant or whatever are the things you have to optimize for to stay as far away from the fences as possible. Yeah. But when you owe somebody something and they, you know they depend on you, then you have reasons to find your way around it, to change the rules if you need to, to find the rule that isn't the one you thought governed where you are, if you can, to be a little less conservative in your interpretation of the rules. Those are the two forces that are always in tension. And if you don't have a way to make sure that you're keeping, I always think about this in terms of basketball, your hand on the player you're meant to be guarding so that when he or she moves, you know about it, even if you're looking the other way. If you don't have a way to do that, they're going to end up at the hoop before you even know about it. And you're still going to be guarding this square meter over here. Yeah. So yeah. It, it reminds me a lot. And maybe it's because I've got like complex systems on the brain. I'm in the middle of the uh, Joint Special Operations University's introduction to military design. And they're very like they're very cerebral and heady there about their, you know, the concepts of uh, of applying design. But uh, one of my favorite uh, things that people say about complex systems is that um, the only accurate model of a complex system is the system itself, right? You, you can come up with an idea of what the system is, but it is not going to be an accurate depiction. So compliance often is based on our idea, our like analysis of the system at a snapshot in time. But because it's a complex system, that just rapidly stops being really reflective of the true nature of the system, right? So the if indeed it was ever reflective to begin yeah, with. Yeah, exactly. So the only way to know whether whether our, you know, our compliance efforts are are really uh, reasonable for the system itself is to constantly be measuring them against the real system, not our idea of the system, not our map that we made of the system, because that is not going to be an accurate depiction. It's it's in contact with the system, and that's what like these things like Scrum and uh, and human centered design and and design thinking and lean startup do is they force you to constantly be no now bounce it off of the real people out there because that's what's going to tell you whether you're still yeah. on the right track. Yeah. And it's so striking to me that we were so religious about that in some contexts and we're so oblivious about it in most contexts, Yeah. right? I mean, you you know, at the basic school, they spend a lot of time telling you like, you better do your leader's recon before you issue your order or like there's gonna be some weird stuff on that terrain you're sending your Marines into and you're not gonna know about it. So go get the ground truth, right? See it for yourself, yeah. check. 
in design terms, we'd say get out of the building, right, is step mm -hmm. one. And then we come home and we're not thinking about kinetic operations anymore. And all of a sudden we're not responsible for the ground truth. We're not responsible for checking in with the environment and making sure that we own it rather than vice versa. Bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I've seen like senior leaders. I, I mean, I've been that airman who like the whatever, like the the wing commander or something came into our spaces and learned something just having a conversation with us. And I'm like, how are you just finding out about this experience that we're having? You know, like, <laughs> all you had to do. It, it's crazy how often it happens. Like yeah. these, the senior leader, they find a way to get out of their compliance, you know, like centric very protected, very, you know, enmeshed in these theoretical models of what, uh, what the system is supposed to be. And, and every time I see them go down into the people, like out, get out of the building, go among the people and have a conversation about what their experiences of producing value or their experience of accomplishing the mission, they mm -hmm. always, always, always learn things. It is so strange to me that I've, I've seen this play out as many times as I have because, and, and it's too, it, it really is kind of a, it speaks to our culture of the more important people get, the further from the actual system they mm -hmm. get, like they get protected from the reality on the ground, which is why I, to me, storytelling is so important, right? It's because mm -hmm. I have this perspective that I can push to people and and it, it really comes from that experience of just being like all you had to do was come down and have a conversation with an e2 and and you would have learned something yeah uh because that's where the real system is guys uh we're gonna have to do a part two at some time because i feel like we have literally just scratched the surface I'm already. just getting warm, I'm man. I, I know. I, I know. We I know. That's hours. the sad part about this. We're gonna ha literally gonna have to schedule part two because I feel like we've just started diving into the mentality of what design thinking is and how people can get about. I mean, we didn't even get the chance to cover how the average person out there can get tied into an organization. But for this session, we are unfortunately out of time. We're gonna have to wrap it up. But we're gonna do our, our around the horn moment real quick. Uh, and then we're definitely going to have to get a part two scheduled because we need to make sure that people can get tied into the design thinking mindset and figure out how they can get connected. So if we had a parting shot real quick, John, this is what we normally do when we wrap up parting shots to be able to say, hey, what is the one thing you want people to know before we uh, depart the disruptive AF, the edge of innovation right here uh, on the podcast? What would that be? What was a, what's the a one thing you want people to know from this session? I don't know. We've we've covered so much ground. I feel like I want them to know where the rewind button is, so they can go <laughs> watch the bits they missed. <laughs> oh man, that's good. Okay, yeah, that's right. true. Hey, and the good news is you can watch and rewatch and watch and rewatch it again because rewind is right there for you. I want to know whose idea it was to not do two-hour episodes. <laughs> it wasn't mine. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, it was yours. No, seriously, guys. Hey, hey, stay tuned because we are going to have John back. You don't know it, but we're inviting you back again for part two, where we can actually take the the, the tactical approach of how does an individual get tied into the mindset? How do you not only get signed up for the courses, but what does that even look like for the person who is at their wing or out there at their squad or at their unit uh, to be able to get tied into this mentality and this thinking? Uh, and we'll make sure that we include the links to not only some of those locations. Uh, Naval X, the design thinking, the things that we have referenced in this episode so that you can just click on those and follow and stay up to date. But look forward, John, we look forward to having you back here again. I can't wait to be back. You got to you got to remind me when I'm back. We got to talk about P equals NP and we got to talk about uh, the ways that what commanders need and uh, what their subordinates need differ when you're thinking about innovation. Absolutely. Will Dan make notes and I'm going to hit the rewind button so we don't forget it at all. Absolutely. Guys, it's been a trip. It's been absolute a blast talking about design thinking here on the Disruptive AF Podcast. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to get the notifications if you're watching on YouTube as we roll out more great content to keep you on the edge of innovation in the defense innovation environment each and every week. Also, make sure you follow us along on Spotify uh, and anywhere that podcasts are available as you listen in. Dan, John, it's been a blast. Thank you for being with us here in Disruptive AF. And we will see you guys next time for part two with John. Yeah, it might not be next time. It might be two times from now. But we will have you back to talk specifically how we dive in and get connected. Thanks again for tuning in to Disruptive AF. <laughs>